The third thing is analytic functions and converters. These are the Java plugins that we run over a result set that's returned from a database if you want to do a bit, uh, something that's a bit more special like um, doing some sort of forecasting, like, you know, uh, naive forecasting or, you know, triple exponential smoothing in terms of, you know, trying to smooth out uh, future uh, or trend lines, doing things like, you know, percentage or maximum out of the data set that I get back, you know, well, what, what are my top and bottom end results of the data set that I get back? So the amount of work that's required here is essentially directly proportional to the number of rows that return from the database, but also what you're trying to do in the actual plugin itself. So the complexity also uh, plays a big part. Geometry. So what actually happens when you have geospatial data is that it could be available um, you know, by default in a well-known text, well-known binary form. So the representation of such geometry, we basically convert that into a, a geometry object within the elephant, and then we show that on the, the maps and the charts. So again, the performance of this is directly proportional to the number of points in a shape and the number of rows returned from the database. So for example, if I want to show 10,000 points in this area here, that's going to take me a bit more resource than showing five points. Okay, So what you're seeing here is actually a real GIS report, as you can see, I'm floating over each shape, you know, it's not a picture, and, you know, it's consuming some resources trying to generate this, which is fine, a little pretty quickly, but, and that's because I have a geometry cache running in the background. So remember how we talked about the LRU caches? The geometry cache is one of the caches here that's responsible for a fast and snappy load uh, of shapes, and again, enabling these sort of caches can minimize, you know, the effort required for the conversion process. But again, there is overhead when rendering a map chart compared to like a standard graph, like a bar chart, okay? So if your users are actually using a lot of maps and a lot of map interaction, then maybe you need a bit more memory to support a larger geometry cache. Advanced so queries. These are also known as federated queries or when people talk about data blending and merging, they're actually referring to this functionality, which essentially is joining two different data sets on the fly um, from two different uh, disparate uh, databases. So, for example, you know, I could be grabbing sales data from a particular database, you know, like a SQL Server 1, let's just say, and then maybe I want to intersperse that with employee and staff details from another database, like say an Oracle 1, and I have a need to, to report on both of these things at the same time. I could do that with an advanced query where I'm grabbing two data sets from two different databases and I'm combining them at a little port. The work to actually do that once I get the results back from both of these databases is actually done in the application server. So I'm combining that uh, and joining it on the combination that I set within the report. And you know the performance for this is again proportional to the number of rows that we I actually want to generate and what I want to consume from these databases and the unique combinations that I've actually put to combine these two data sets together. Um, slight note for this. The performance is more prevalent in terms of you know the consideration for it for append some queries when you're trying to join two different data sets on a, you know, a common dimension or a category versus just simply you know doing a union where you're just slapping both data sets together on top of each other, which again takes you know, less resources to do. Next thing to think about in terms of performance is calculated fields. So these are basically calculations that you can do on the fly. Things are not covered by your ETL workflow. You can essentially manipulate existing columns and do calculations that you could feed into your Elephant, which again is done and generated on the fly within the application and done um, you know, post ETL. So these aren't covered by your ETL. And if you can, then you know it, the best practice is to actually put as many of the calculations you have into ETL process, but we do recognize that there's certain cases where you know you do need to calculate things that are based on the filters, which again is what the calculate field is for. But in doing so, it does consume you know, you know memory, and it does actually need a CPU sometimes to do according to you know your calculation formula. Cache filters. So this is what we talked about earlier, where we want to prepare. Uh, values into a filter and store that beforehand so that's you know available as a drop down or a multi-select 
rather than going back to the database to get the values at report runtime. We also allow people to create things like dependent filters, where you have a hierarchy of filters that basically is influenced by the selection of a filter from before. So I could select maybe, for example, a country filter, and the next filter would then show me only the states for the filter that I've chosen before. So show me all, all uh, you know, Australian states. And if I click on a particular state like Victoria, then maybe my third um, filter, which shows towns and suburbs, will only then show uh, you know, the areas within Victoria. All right. So if there is a hierarchy or a dependent drop-down filter hierarchy, then the entire hierarchy is stored in the cache filter cache. And if no role level security is implemented, then we'll only store one hierarchy. If role level security is actually implemented and I have a cache filter here kicking to play in the report, it would actually store each um, combination against each user. Again, for example, um, you know, a user could see different things in role level security, so we also need to basically run all different versions of that and then save them against each user which again could consume more resources in your cache filter cache. It's also important to note that the performance we we're talking about here is slightly unique in this case, in the cache filter uh, scenario, because it's actually related to the background hierarchy generation rather than at report runtime, which affects the other factors. So in this case, the performance here isn't really about how much do I need when I run this report, it's more about how much performance do I need to actually generate that background hierarchy here, which is done as a background task, okay? Which again, very neatly segues us into the background task section, which is the last one. So we've gone through a lot of things, you know, we've gone through the application factors, we've gone through the system requirements, but now lastly, what are the things that we need to actually think about in terms of doing background tasks? So there are certain things that we do automatically within Yellowfin that allows um, you know, processing threads uh, to be done at some other time. So rather than the things that a user is actually doing by the browser, these background tasks are actually spawned by a, an actual task schedule within the application. Important to note, the tasks here can be multi-threaded, so it covers these five things over here, um, which again I'll talk through very quickly. We flatten groups as a background task. So for example, if we use LDAP as a user management module, we can uh, at a certain time pull and pull an Active Directory or an LDAP network to see if there's any changes between the users, you know, whether they've joined new groups, whether the users have been deleted or not, or there are new users. We can synchronize that way with a group flattening process and load that into Yellowfin. That's how we basically maintain synchronizations between you know, an external user management module versus one in Yellowfin. Then we can also cache filters at a particular time. So you can schedule that to run at a particular time on a particular day and have that happen um, say at 4 a.m. and it will go and retrieve the, the relevant filter values as needed. Okay. We can also broadcast reports. So for example, I could set a report to be broadcasted at you know, 5 p.m. in the day, and then when 5 p.m. starts, the, the background task will call the broadcasting task, and it will do the work that's needed. And then I could also schedule, lastly, a report to be cached at a certain time as well. So important for business scenarios where I want to go, um, let's have a, a, a status report be run at 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to cache that data so that when all my users log into Yellowfin, they'll be viewing the cache data rather than inundating the database um, to get the source data. So these five tasks are usually run um, at a you know, time that's you know, out of business hours, or again, in business hours if you want. But five of these are basically configured to run at the same time, um, at different times of the day. But you can actually you know, modify this uh, to a different time of day as well if you want. There are also certain times where you could set up secondary pools. So remember how it shows you to set the connection pool. There is an option there to actually set a secondary pool if you want to reserve that secondary pool for actions like these. So it doesn't actually consume connections from your primary pool. So some of the things you can think about in terms of balancing um, workloads. And you want to do more of these things, then naturally you need to allocate more resources to 